All right, welcome back to the course. This is the beginning of section five where we're going to talk about how we create the game UI. So that includes menus and HUDs and stuff like that. So without further ado, let's jump into it. We're going to be talking about creating a main menu in this video. So let's jump into Unity. Here in Unity, I have my main menu folder in my project and I have a scene with a little script in there. And essentially, this is what we're going to build. So this is just sort of an overview of what it's going to look like. Let's go ahead and create it from scratch so that you can understand sort of the process that I use behind building UIs. And I think it'll help you understand a little bit better what it is that's going on here. So I'm going to go ahead and delete everything except everything beneath the canvas. So I'm going to go ahead and delete that. Okay. So with the UI system in Unity, you will be able to sort of block things out using panels. There's nothing really special about a panel, actually. In fact, all it is is just an image, right? And it just by default has the stretch and center to pivot. Um, so it just fills up all the space available to it. So this is good for blocking out. Obviously, we can uh, delete the image and just use it sort of for reference. In this case, I'm going to leave it. I actually want to use it. And so I'm going to set the colors here to black and maybe make it a little bit more opaque so it's more visible. So it sort of dims the screen. Okay, great. So I have that. And I'm going to call this background, which is what I had before. Okay, so now I have my background and I want a panel sort of in the middle of this background. So I'm going to go ahead and create another one. And I'm going to go here and select a panel. So I don't want this panel to be quite so big. In fact, I want it to sort of anchor in the center. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And one of the things that you can do is if you just select this, it won't actually change any of the dimensions for you. What I do is I hold, as it says here, shift and alt. And that's going to change the pivot for me. And it's also going to set the position. So you won't notice a big change. Uh, but you will if you were doing something uh, a little different with size. So I'll show you an example here. So I'm going to make this a little bit smaller. 640 maybe, and then 480. Sure, that looks good. So if I were to set the pivot here in the corner, and I just click it without holding any modifier keys, it just kind of sets it there, but then it retains the offset, which is good if that's what you want. But if you hold Alt and Shift, it actually zeroes out the offsets, and it just moves it to that location where you wanted it. In this case, I want it in the center, so I'm going to go ahead and do Alt, Shift, and click. So now it's in the center. Great. So this is sort of a reference. This is where the menu will be contained. And I want two elements to be inside of this. I'm going to call this the menu panel. And I want to add a couple more things to this. So for starters, I want my logo. So I'm going to add an image. And again, you'll notice between panel and image, there isn't really a difference. In fact, the only difference is the rec transform default settings, but it just is an image. So I already made a nice little logo here. So I'm going to set that. Actually, let's, let's just scale this up to see. I want it to take up the whole top portion here. So I'm going to hold Alt, Shift and it's going to stretch across the top, right? And I want it to be actually a little bit taller than that. So let's make it like 200 pixels. Okay, that looks a little better. Let's try maybe 240. You'll notice though, because it's stretching, it's a little bit, you know, the aspect ratio is sort of lost here. So what you want to do is select preserve aspect here in the image. And the rec transform will take up all the space that it needs to, but the image will maintain its aspect ratio within that. That looks great. You can also set native size if you want to use things one to one. If you design them exactly pixel perfect, you could do this. That's not what I want, so I'm going to go ahead and reset that. And so leave preserve aspect on. Okay, great. So next, I'm going to go ahead and rename this. All right, so now I want to make sort of my little container here with buttons. Now I can manually place the buttons, but that's kind of a pain if I want to add or remove buttons. So I'm going to go ahead and make it a little bit more dynamic. So under the menu panel, as a sibling to my logo, I'm going to create another panel, which is a container for my buttons. So I'm going to call it button container. And again, I could remove the image, but I want to be able to sort of see the differences here. So I'm going to actually anchor this one to the bottom and stretch at the bottom. And I'll use half the size so it sort of coincides. Obviously, I'm lining these up to fit, but you want to use whatever works for your layout. All right, so my button container. And you'll notice I can see here, I'll, I can change the color if I want it to be more explicit about, you know, visualizing where this is. Okay, great. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add a component to this called layout. And there are a few different options. There's a grid layout group, horizontal, and vertical. In my case, I want to use a vertical. I want the buttons to be laid out vertically. So what this does is for anything that is a child of this particular transform, it's going to auto-arrange the elements underneath it for me. So let me show you. I'm going to go ahead and create another object underneath it. I'm going to create another panel. Great. And so this panel, I don't want to mess with any of its settings here because those will be driven by that script. So I'm going to go ahead and leave that as is. You can't even see it here, actually, because it's sort of stuck in the corner because it's currently being driven by that script. So I'm going to add a component here. And it's a layout element. 
So anything with a layout element will be driven by a layouts group. So the parent has a layout group and it's going to drive its child. So I want to sort of let it do its thing here. So the, the child will control the size and I don't want to force expand the height, but I do want the width. So you can see here if I zoom in that the full width is being used, but the height is being set by the child. Now currently the child's not actually setting the value to anything. So I want to do that. I'm going to set the height to be preferred height of, let's say, I don't know, 128. That's a little bit much. Let's try uh, 64. That looks a little bit better. Okay, so actually I don't like that this is sort of stretched all the way. So I have a couple of options. I can make it so that it doesn't expand the width automatically and I set that. And I'd also want to center it here. So I'll use uh, middle center. Great, so it's going to, of all the space available to it, it's going to try to center itself. And I'm going to let the child define the width as well. So I'm going to set that here. And I'm going to set a preferred width of, let's say, 240. Let's go higher. 320 looks good to me. Now, if I want to add elements, I can just either, this saves you from having to automatically or manually place things. You can automatically do it. So if I hit Control D or Command D if you're on Mac to duplicate this panel, watch what happens. See how it auto lays it out for me? I can do it again. And it'll keep doing it for me indefinitely. You can have it stretch, actually overflow. In this case, it's just using all the space, so it's squeezing all the ones that don't fit. I only need three buttons here for this demo, so I'm going to delete the rest. And actually, I'm going to delete all of them because there's another step I want to take here. So I've deleted everything here, and I'm going to take this panel. And I'm going to add a button to it. Instead of a panel, you could have had this be the button. I like to separate things into panels because it gives me a little bit more flexibility with how I want things to sort of redraw. So here, I'm going to go ahead and add a button to it. And then I have this button stretched to fill all the space available to it, which is this parent panel here. Again, Alt-Shift, stretch on all directions. Great. So now the button takes up the entire space. Same thing for the text. I want the text to take up all the space available to it. So I'm going to go ahead and do that here. What I like to do is not use Best Fit because Best Fit will cause a little bit of a performance hit. But I do turn it on to sort of get an idea of what the font size is, right? And then I sort of adjust from there. So I turn off Best Fit. And then I want to go up to maybe 40. Okay, that looks good. I'm going to do 32, actually. Even better. I'm going to set this to black. All right, it's starting to take shape. So this button here, let's rename this button. This is going to be my Start button. Great, Start Game. And then I actually want to use that here in my button text as well. All right, let's, add it. let's duplicate this object a couple times. I actually du <laughs> duplicated the wrong thing. I duplicated the button side of it. So what I actually want to duplicate is this parent container. There we go. And so I'll take the start game here and it's actually going to be continue. And I modify the child text as well. Great. And then lastly, let's make a settings button. And change the text here. Okay, I've sort of got it there to where I want it to be. Maybe I'd like a little bit more spacing between these elements. They're a little bit too smushed together. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to select the parent, which is the button container. And you'll notice here that I can modify the spacing by putting a value here. So it's going to evenly space them out. And you know what? I think 12 pixels looks pretty good. So I'm going to leave it that way. And there we go. So if I go ahead and hit play, My buttons all work properly. And then if you wanted to, and this is the part where you art it up, you know, you take your designer's art and you sort of do what you want with it there. In this case, I'm going to just hide a few things that are just there for my reference. They aren't part of the design. So I'm going to, for example, turn off this image. Actually, not that image, sorry, the menu panel image. That looks better. And I'm actually just going to hide the button container as well. And that looks good. So essentially, you know, there's no frame, but you could have a frame if you wanted to. For example, if I turn it back on, I can swap it out for, you know, any of these built-in Unity images here. I don't really like any of these, so let's go and turn it off. So that looks pretty good to me. So next is, how do we make this actually do anything? So let's say I don't have a game saved yet, you know, I want to be able to disable this button. So let's just click Interactable Off, and that'll sort of select its disabled button. Let's make that a little more obvious, like a 64 just to make it a little bit darker. 
And I want to do that as well on my settings button. Okay, and I'll turn off interactable. Great, so now I actually only have a start game button, which is what I want. And so how do I get this to work? So I've created a script here. Let's take a look. It's a very simple script. There are several ways that you could build your menus, and obviously it's going to depend entirely on you. I would encourage you to use some of the concepts that you've learned earlier in this video to make your behavior more abstract. In this case, there isn't any special behavior. I just want to show you how the buttons work. So I created a main menu button, and all it has is a go to level script. Again, this could be any level. It takes a string, which is the level name, and then it calls scene manager dot load scene, which is a Unity API call, and it loads that level by its name using the string. Okay, so how do we use this? Let's go back to Unity. I go to File, Build Settings, and I have to add my scenes here. So first, start off with the main menu, and you'll see why in the next section. And then I'm going to go to my let's say I want to jump into the boss level. So I have my boss sandbox there. The name is important, let's remember that. So let's close that out. And then on my menu panel, I'm going to go ahead and add the main menu script to it. So I can just drag and drop. There we go. And you'll notice that uh, there isn't anything exposed or anything like that. That's because you can use the built in functionality and the Unity event system. So if I go to my start game button, you'll notice that it has an on click event handler here. So I can add a new event. And so this allows you to select things that other scripts and call funk methods on them when a click is called on this button. So I can do that here. So I'll do uh, my menu panel. And then I have access to see all the components on it and all the scripts that are public. So my main menu one has all these that are sort of inherited from mono behavior because it's a mono behavior. And I want to call a load or go to level, sorry. And this is where I would put in the string name of that scene, which is boss sandbox. Excellent. So let's I and see what happens. Okay, and I'm going to hit start game. And there you go, it loaded into the scene. And it's the exact same scene we saw earlier in the prototype, or sorry, in the sandbox. Okay, so let's hit stop there. And now, there is another way to do this. The event system is okay. Maybe a little bit slower than if you use regular events, but you can also do this programmatically. I'm going to show you how real quick. So let's go back to our main menu. And let's take a look at the script. I'm going to modify it now to have a reference to the button. So I'm going to add it here and I'm going to make it serializable. And then I'm going to add a reference to that button here. So we'll just do button. Okay, so I have my start game button here. And instead of using this, well, we'll remove it in a second. I'm actually going to use the API for that. So in the awake method, okay, in the awake method, I'm going to go ahead and set something there. So I'm going to assume that it's not null, of course, in your own code, make sure that you always null check things because you don't know if they're going to be available or not. Even better yet, you can uh, look into unit testing and sort of test if those things are correct. But for now, I just want to demonstrate a different point. So let's go ahead and do that. And then there is a on click. I'm using the wrong UI thing here. So something to uh, look into is when you are auto-completing things, your ID may sometimes pick the wrong thing. So I don't want the experimental UI elements. I just want Unity's regular UI. Great, so now it's going to use the right button and I'll have access to the correct API, which is on click. And then for regular events, as you've seen, we would add a subscriber to it by doing this, right? Plus equals. Um, but that's not what we want to do here. So because it's not a regular event, it's a Unity event. So they provided a method to do this, which is called add listener. And there's add listener, and then to it you pass the Unity action that you want to call. So I'm going to call start game, and I want to actually create this method because it doesn't exist yet. And then in the implementation, I'm actually just going to call go to level and pass in a hard coded string here, or like a string literal. So let's do that here. Okay, so we've accomplished something very similar. So now what I'm doing is with through a reference to the button, on awake I'm going to add a listener to it, and then I'm going to call start game when that button is clicked, and start game calls go to level, which loads a level for me. The other thing I want to do, and this is something to be very aware of, is you want to clean up these events when you're done. 
whether they're Unity events or regular events. So you can do that on disable or on destroy. I'll do on disable. And I'll change this to on enable just to be consistent. Okay, there's on enable. Okay, and then let's clean it up here. And we'll call remove all listeners. And that'll clean it up for us so that you don't have any stray events happening when things have been disabled or don't exist anymore. Um, super important to do this on your cleanup. You may not have seen me do it in all the examples, but for sure do this in your own code. It'll prevent a lot of bugs in the future. Okay, so let's take a look at how this works. First thing I want to do is go to the button. Once it's compiled, okay, and then I want to remove this event here because I don't want it to double fire. And then in my menu panel, I want to assign the button, okay? And so everything will be handled by code for us from here on out. Okay, so let's go ahead and start. And same effect. So everything works as intended. Now you could use the timeline system or animators or do whatever you want with animations to sort of snazz this up. But essentially that's why you want to hook up the UI, the buttons, to the rest of your code.